I'd now like to welcome our moderator, Maybelin Bing from the College of the Marshall Islands. Over to you, Maybelin. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry about that. So thank you again, James. Um, depending on where you're tuning in from, I wish to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. And thank you for joining us in this session. At this session, we will be talking about ensuring the future, looking at creative solutions for risk management. I wish to welcome our esteemed panelists, as well as everyone else that's joining us through the Zoom and through other social media outlets. A very warm greetings from the Marshall Islands, where I am currently based. My name is Maybelline Bing, and I will be the moderator for this session. I am currently an adjunct instructor at the College of the Marshall Islands in the business program, but previously served as the Secretary of Finance for the RMI government. It is an absolute pleasure to have this opportunity to moderate the discussions around mitigating risk in small economies, and might I emphasize smaller island economies and finding creative insurance solution for infrastructure projects. As we all can agree, smaller economies are most vulnerable to natural disasters, yet access to infrastructure insurance is often very challenging. And these disaster risk challenges adds on to the many more challenges that smaller economies do face and have on hand. So we are very pleased and very much looking forward to hearing from our panelists as they discuss solutions and opportunities as we also hear these discussions on creative infrastructure insurance uh, solutions, we will also be uh, listening through um, resiliency in the face of or post disasters. So I am very pleased now to introduce to you our distinguished pan panelists, uh, starting off with Martin Gimmick, who is the Chief Risk Officer at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Martin heads the AIIB's risk management department. His main responsibilities are to ensure stability and financial continuity of AIIB. Um, previously, he spent 24 years at the World Bank, primarily at the International Finance Corporation, where he held leadership positions in both investment operation and risk management. We also have Mr. Alotu Palu, who is now the CEO of the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company. Alotu has 25 years of experience in the economic management, finance, and development sector as reflected by his various roles in the region and nationally. Prior to becoming the CEO, he was also with the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat as the GIZ Climate Finance and Public Financial Management Advisor. He was also a chief secretary and a secretary to the cabinet for the government of Tonga. And last but not least, we will have Dr. Ast I mean, Astrid Zwick, who is the head of the Insu Resilience Secretariat. She has been the head of uh, Insu Insur Resilience Secretariat, supporting the B20 G20 led in resilience global partnership in its goal to foster climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. So as I previously stated, the panelists will be presenting on solutions and opportunities while at the same time promoting resiliency in an uncertain future. So now before I call on the panelists, I'd like to do a run through of uh, some housekeeping. First, for our audience, you will be muted and your videos will be uh, off throughout the session. However, we do encourage you to put your questions um, and also state your names, where you're from and who the questions will be directed to. Uh, that way it will be easier for me as the moderator to address the questions to the right person. Um, and as for the panelists, uh, you will have 10 minutes each to do your presentation and I will be coming back on camera two minutes prior to finishing. And so without any more further uh, delays, I would like to call upon our first um, speaker, Martin. Martin, please, you have it, the floor. Thank you. Let me uh, share screen. Here we go, share screen, yes. Oh, this is working. Yes, here we go. 
So, hello everyone. Um, as Maybelline said, I'm the chief risk officer, I'm worried about risks. At the same time, I'm representing an infrastructure investment bank of Asia. So I will cover those aspects, essentially risk profiles of island economies, as well as uh, what is happening in the infra space and cover obviously uh, the risk section to, to, to a large extent, and then would leave uh, uh, the insurance challenges and opportunities to my colleagues from the insurance sector. Um, very quickly, this slide shows you essentially all what's going on in, in small economies uh, uh, on islands. They have unique challenges. Um, they all highly concentrated in the economic profile, meaning uh, largely dependent uh, essentially on uh, to tourism, with some exceptions on financial services. So we have built financial service center, uh, uh, mainly in the Caribbean and, and uh, in, in Mauritius. But the rest of all is maybe a little bit of fisheries, but largely uh, depends on the uh, tourism sector. They're very vulnerable to economic shocks as well as to other exogenous shocks, such as natural disaster and climate change. And they have a significant capacity co constraint to, to limited economic opportunities. So the real challenge is how to, to design a growth path and how to build resiliency. Below, you see the universe of islands. And essentially, we grouped them in three different groups. There's a World Bank table, uh, less than 200,000, uh, between 200,000, 1.5 million, and then above 1.5 million. The largest portion is obviously uh, between 0.2 and 1.5 million, and below 0.2 million. Just to give you an idea, I'm joining you from Beijing. I'm living in a district, Chaoyang district, which alone has 3.4 million people. Beijing is 24 million people. 570 kilometer subway system to give you sort of a, an, an extreme uh, 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 example. So on the upper right, you essentially see a distribution of uh, the, the uh, impact and contributions of the tourism sector. Uh, the dark purple is direct and, and, and the orange is the indirect contribution, but both should be added up to, to uh, recognize the contributions and the dependency of the tourism sector. Um, on average, uh, it, it's, it's essentially for all island uh, economies, it's above 10%, but obviously if we look at the Maldives, uh, Vanuatu, Fiji, uh, and even Kiribati uh, 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 in, the Pacific, in the Asian Pacific hemisphere, uh, it, it's essentially up to 70% of uh, GDP. Uh, if you go on the other side, uh, to the Western Hemisphere, I, uh, Aruba is a bit of an exception because uh, it also has a, has a strong uh, uh, financial sector, but also you see uh, dependencies are even higher, meaning uh, the tourism sector, given its ge geographic location, has even a higher contribution on, on average. Below, you essentially see uh, the impact and vulnerability on a per capita basis uh, from climate change. And you obviously see that the climate economies by far are exposed to, to risks from climate change. On the right side, you see uh, the number of natural disasters. I mean, the, the unit is on a, on a per square million square kilometer basis. But you see on the right hand side that essentially small islands are hit twice as high as, as most other states uh, with respect to natural disasters. And, and by the way, COVID is another natural disaster. So um, a few things just to sum up this page. We have eco economies that are highly concentrated in, in terms of their, their economic uh, uh, universe and, and growth path, huge dependency on the tourism, uh, much higher than average vulnerability to do both uh, uh, climate change and natural disasters. 
So let's look a little bit outside what is happening in the rest of the world. And these are simply the big mega trends in the world, and they will continue. Biggest mega trend that continues, particularly in Asia, is a demographic change. I, I've shown you here uh, by 2030, we're essentially going to have twice the size of the middle class uh, population that we had in 2015. Um, second, continued urbanization. Uh, mega centers are going to continue uh, 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 to uh, grow, particularly in Asia. You've seen the very uh, red spots, uh, spots. These are the mega cities, and they're essentially concentrated uh, uh, in China and in India. Uh, at the same time, you see uh, and, and, and uh, sustainable investment goals represented through the SDGs require substantial investments. Uh, the highest shares are energy of 20% and the other second highest share, if you combine them together, even a higher share is 18% and 3% of, of climate mitigation, climate adaptation, which are probably cautious estimates and, and are probably higher. So again, these are two, both are core infra sector um, focused areas that show the tremendous investment need uh, uh, that is arising uh, from these demands. On the right side, you see the other big, big trend and that's uh, regionalization. Uh, we might take a little bit of a breather from globalization, but regionalization is continuing. What does this mean for island economies? Well, on one side, the good of tourism will continue to be in high demand, uh, both from a scarcity of resource perspective and, and secondly, sim simply from a, from a demand perspective out of income. Moving a bit to the infrastructure picture, uh, and I just, these are sort of the big disruptors in, in, in infrastructure. And, and they do present significant opportunities for island economies. Obviously, island, uh, given the small scale in island economies, infrastructure per capita is significantly more expensive than it is in scale economies. But these disruptive technologies, and, and, and if you only look at it, um, mobile connectivity, cloud technology, and, and renewables, uh, you see uh, this will offer very different opportunities to catch up at a more comparable cost level uh, to uh, infrastructure uh, uh, connections with the rest of the world at, at much more competitive uh, price levels. It also offers the opportunity for uh, green infrastructure as, 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 as most of these technologies that aren't disrupting are actually uh, belonging uh, uh, to the sustainable uh, green uh, 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 sectors. Uh, the biggest thing, I mean, I just have, show, have shown here, I'm trying to move to the next page. Uh, it's not coming. Hold on. Oops, here we go. Uh, this is simply sort of the, the, the impact that we expect. Uh, uh, one is obviously the, the um, mobile connectivity and, and then, but other things are, are certainly also on the uh, cloud technology side, as I said, uh, but we expect uh, alone through, through the mobile connectivity to, to have a massive uh, impact of, of four to, to 10 times fold uh, in the next uh, uh, five years. This is sort of a classic uh, infrastructure picture. Um, uh, it just shows uh, uh, that it, it translates into all subsector smart grids, uh, 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 more, more efficiency, smart meters, intelligent traffic so solution, a lot that is happening on water, also water moving from a pure public good meaning, it's provided by public utilities, now more and more being provided also by, by private utilities uh, that deliver quality where consumers are happy to, uh, to pay for. And then the whole area of, of uh, smart cities, uh, data connection that makes the whole 
com communities more intelligent, uh, energy efficient and, and, and service friendly. So the question really is uh, how to develop infrastructure in a climate resilient way and there uh, with such infrastructure reduce the vulnerabilities and at the same time use those technological disruptions that have started to, to shake up uh, the traditional area of infrastructure. Uh, it does obviously mean uh, island economies have to attract financing. Uh, to attract financing, I mean, there are lessons that one has to consider for the investor, but also lessons one has to consider for the investee. Uh, opposite from an investor's perspective, what do they want? They want to have a uh, legal, civil in environment that uh, reduces uh, uh, at large all regulatory and political risks. They want to mitigate all uncertainties with respect to uh, co construction, all risks uh, uh, relating to future offtake agreements, concession ag agreements with, with, uh, with local governments. Uh, at the same time, the investees are obviously concerned about uh, uh, the, the size and the, the power relationship they're going to have with the lenders. And there obviously the, the issue of a sustainable development plans uh, uh, for, for small islands will be very, very important. And one has to see there is a, there is a certain dis, uh, imbalance of, of resources where large multinational investors can mobilize a lot of intellectual resources, engineering resources, et cetera, et cetera. That is then typically met by planning resources on, on a, on a, on an island level from a governance from a government's perspective that is simply no match so that that to me is a big challenge on, on how to own your own uh, a sustainable uh, development path uh, that uh, ultimately uh, uh, reflects the wish of the people and, and not just maximizes the profit of of of, uh, of multinational uh, tourist companies so to, to sum it up, in, in, in if we look at 2020, obviously um, hit was essentially all through tourism, uh, airlines, uh, uh, shipping. You had some economies that dropped in GDP. I mean, what, one of the highest ones uh, uh, is, is the Maldives, uh, uh, is Aruba, is Antigua. Bahamas uh, uh, that essentially dropped between 20 and 30 percent in GDP in 2020. If you think that an average growth rate in these countries, I don't know, four or five percent, they have been moved backwards in, in, in development by five to ten years. At the same time, the outlook for 21 uh, still lags behind uh, uh, the recovery outlook of the non-island economies because as the core dependencies on, on this on the tourist sector is, is is pointing to a much lower recovery obviously we have seen as some of the the bigger of the islands uh, have access the, the the private capital markets and have ratings uh, so i would say aruba would be the exception given the financial industry, they actually have an investment rate rating, but the rest of the islands is essentially that are rated and seek financing on the capital markets are essentially in, in the B uh, with, with, uh, with many of them with negative outlooks, sort of uh, reflecting uh, the weak cash flow situation and the increase, a significant increase in uh, fiscal deficits, which, uh, essentially uh, 2020 was 10 percent 15 percent 20 percent these are the ranges but uh, the central government cross that has has almost doubled in, in, in a number of those economies uh, with that i also want to point to the opportunity uh, there is uh, uh, to come out of the recovery uh, 
to utilize, as I said, these, these uh, new technologies in the infra space that will help to build a more resilient uh, infrastructure supporting the economies to be better prepared for their natural disposition to, to, uh, to natural the, the disasters, which we're not going to be able to change. But what we can change is sort of build the appropriate infrastructure that on one side is affordable, that has the right scale and, and, and meets those needs of, of uh, those island economies. With that, I'm closing and passing on to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Martin, for those points you made. Um, you, you, I think, nailed um, the points on how difficult the island economies are. Um, they have unique challenges, and you've also pointed some of the areas where we could invest um, for better resiliencies. Um, so at this time, um, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Alotu for your presentation. Alotu, you have um, the line. Thank you. Thank you, Mevelyn. I'm not sure whether the camera is on or... It's not on, if you could okay. turn it on. Okay, there it is. There you are. Thank you, Medlin. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon from the Pacific. Let me begin by thanking the organizer for the opportunity extended to the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Insurance Company, or Big Creek for short, to be part of this great event that brings together financiers, development partners, and regulators to share and exchange expertise on sustainable and inclusive financial structures in island communities. The theme for this session is relevant and appropriate to the current effort of the company, which was established as the formal request of the Pacific Finance Ministers, also known as the Forum Economic Ministers in 2016. To serve the countries, we are creating innovative solutions to manage risk. But to understand the practical applications of the existing solutions that we're offering and what is currently in designing, first we have to conduct a comprehensive risk assessment to improve and to have a better understanding of risk management and the crucial risks that countries face. Without a knowledge of what risks a country is facing, it is not possible to implement appropriate and cost-effective risk management solutions, whether that be projects to reduce or mitigate risk or to better prepare for inevitable shocks caused by disaster. Well, in the past, countries have at the time of post-disaster something more like a UN appeal for assistance. We all know that takes some time to materialize, while at the same time, we see pictures of people dying or suffering, and some that they are suffering because they lost their basic social and economic livelihoods. At the same time, we are awaiting for money to be donated or arranged to help us. But now the Pacific has taken charge by establishing an innovative solution and developing a mechanism to manage these natural hazards. And then the support from donors, multilateral or bilateral comes later. That is what the company does, promote proactive planning and provide immediate financial support. For us in the Pacific, the biggest innovations in this area were the comprehensive risk assessment work done initially under the Pacific Catastrophe Risk Assessment and Financing Initiative, PICRAFI, which resulted in the creations of the Pacific Risk Information System hosted by the Pacific community. This information or data and the associated catastrophic models form the basis of the insurance product now offered by the company. But the system has also been used by many countries across the region for decision making regarding disaster risk management in general. Using the constructed data and models under this initial project, Pacific seats were able to access international insurance market for the first time. And several countries took out insurance policy, policies for severe tropical cyclone and earthquake and tsunami events. After a successful implementation of the pilot program, the company was formally established in 2016 to ensure these efforts towards countries taking more ownership of the risk they face were being driven by a regional entity that puts the interests and the needs of the countries first. The company is a very young regional company that has a great potential to grow and currently undertaking transformations 
to improve its relevance and capacity to serve the Blue Pacific by offering innovative financial solutions to manage disaster risk. It was born to help address the fact that even though some countries are taking steps towards managing the risk they face, when disasters occur across our region, there is still a greater reliance on donor support to help countries get back on their feet. But this support is uncertain, as we all know, both in what will arrive and when. That is, will it be cash support, goods that perhaps are not needed? And how can country plan without knowing when support will arrive? It is, it is may also not be the most efficient way to help affected populations from the donor's perspective, as waiting for a disaster to occur is far more costly than investing in reducing risk and being prepared for those risks that cannot be reduced. In recent years, there have been attempts to shift the way of thinking from response to preparedness. And this is the core of the company's objectives as a regional entity. This uncertainty about what support may or may not arrive has been made worse by the impact of COVID-19. With donors having an increasing level of competing priorities and facing difficulties in crop or travel and supply of goods. So what does the company offer? At the moment, we offer annual sovereign insurance policies to governments of Pacific Island countries for tropical cyclone, earthquake, and tsunami. The goal of the company is to provide very rapid payouts to country governments after a major event, typically within 10 to 15 days of a disaster occurring. And that's the company's policy, are not expected to cover all the costs associated with a disaster. That would make the policy far too expensive. So to keep it affordable, the goal is to provide a reasonable bailout to provide immediate liquidity in order to help support initial disaster relief and early recovery. The most recent payout from the company was about 4.5 million US made to Tonga in the aftermath of Cyclone Herald in April 2020. The company is considered as a risk pool, similar to the Griffith in the Caribbean and the ARC in Africa. The general concept is that by insuring multiple countries simultaneously, the company can pull the risk of several countries together. And before approaching the international reinsurance markets for umbrella coverage for the participating countries, increasing the level of available bay disaster bailout. This pooling of the risk creates a more diversified portfolio of risk and also results in better rates with the reinsurers. These two factors mean the company can offer cheaper premium for countries compared to the situations where a country seeks the same insurance coverage independently. In addition to cost saving, one of the key innovation that this kind of insurance has brought is the autonomy and discipline that are so important for rapid actions to be taken in a post-disaster disaster environment. The company's products are purposefully intended to give countries the freedom to focus efforts on where the need is greatest rather than potentially what is mandated or expected by the donors. But it is also intended that the payouts from the company will finance a broad set of pre-planned -planned, pre activities. And so this kind of insurance can also bring more attention and effort on building a appropriate consistency plan. By encouraging that kind of thinking about what actions would be taken in certain disaster scenarios, it is also possible for the company to tailor products precisely to the planet response, making the insurance as cost effective as possible. But we appreciate that providing repairs for disaster relief is only part of the picture when it comes to disaster. And so the company is striving to make new innovative products to further assist specific seats in their efforts to build resilience. Firstly, we are developing new products for other risks, specifically excess rainfall events, which may not be associated with tropical cyclones and also drought risk, which many countries across the regions face every year. These products are expected to come, become available later this year or early next year. Further ahead, the company is also looking to develop products that help not only governments, with their financial needs, but also households and potentially small businesses. Initial work with the World Bank has been ongoing for some time to work with the insurance market in several Pacific Island countries to help develop a household level insurance program for homeowners 
that otherwise you would find it difficult or impossible to access insurance. At Pickwick, we believe there is a great opportunity for better interfacing across other disaster risk finance instruments and organizations offering these instruments. With our partners at the World Bank, we are supporting countries developing their own national disaster risk finance strategies, which map out all of the available instruments. For example, budget reserves or contingency funds, contingency credit or saving facilities, and both traditional and parametric insurance. And then ensure these instruments are used effectively to complement each other based on a comprehensive assessment of the risks each country is facing. We fully recognize that other development partners and organizations also work on finance products. And our call here, and our call here is not to compete, but to ensure that our products are complementary to help build the resilience of the Pacific seats across the whole DRM spectrum. In conclusion, the company is fully aware that we are receiving premium from the countries, and besides the disaster event payouts we are contemplating giving back to build knowledge and capacity in the region, such as providing scholarship and intensive opportunities on top of the increasing capacity building to participating in policyholders countries. Thank you and happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you very much, Lotu, and I take your point on the shifting in the focus of pre on preparedness um, rather than um, responding, responding to um, disaster. So thank you for that. We will go ahead and um, have Astrid do your presentation, and after that, we will get back with all the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maybelline. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I recognize that my video option is doing, giving some technical problems. Uh, so hopefully that will solve, but I hope you can hear me well. We hear you loud and clear, Astrid. Wonderful, thank yes. you. Okay, then I will start um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good day, good uh, evening at your audience. And thank you very much for being able to present the Injury Resilience Global Partnership and our activities here in this distinguished uh, panel and uh, distinguished audience. The V20 and G20 led Injury Resilience Global Partnership was launched in 2017 with the aim to strengthen the resilience of developing countries and to protect the lives and livelihoods of poor and vulnerable people from the impacts of disasters. Today, we have nearly 100 members from countries, from the private sector, from uh, non-governmental organizations and academia, but also uh, having multilateral um, uh, banks and um, we have other in uh, international initiatives. You will ask why such a partnership? The challenge to bring resilience to the poor and vulnerable is very high. Climate change is on the rise with a fourfold increase in losses since the 90s. The protection gap is getting larger. That means the insured versus the uninsured losses. And you have, if you look at uh, countries with a low income, you see that uh, insured losses make only uh, 2%, whereas um, the protection gap is much smaller in countries with high income where insured losses make um, 50%. So the coverage is low and we need to look for really good solutions, in particular when looking at the population, the part of population which is really getting into negative coping strategies, uh, the poor and vulnerable that have to sell their uh, last assets and uh, take uh, people out of schools and so on. So we need to look into possibilities to become um, more active risk managers. So no one can act alone. This is a big enterprise and it is needed experience from the private sector, 
financial to support an enabling environment made by the public sector, but also the voices of um, the poor and vulnerable, the NGOs that uh, support here, and also co-create and co-shape solutions. So hedging and de-risking assets, in particularly in countries that are particularly vulnerable, uh, is uh, of utmost importance. And I come back to what Martin Kiddick said, it also will attract investments. If you have an infrastructure, um, a new asset um, to be set up, uh, it is good to have it um, financially insured in case there is a disaster so that you can get rebuilt and even rebuild be better once you understand your risks better. And this will help in economic development. We have created a vision, Vision 2025, with the partnership that promotes to the scale up of prearranged and predictable financing for early action, relief, and recovery embedded in climate and disaster risk management strategies. The objective of the partnership is twofold. First, it helps countries to adequately respond to the impacts of climate change, in particularly after disaster has struck. This is the ex post dimension. But this is also an ex ante dimension. Once you understand the risks better, you can better prepare for these uh, through the use of prearranged climate and disaster risk finance and risk transfer solutions, including insurance. This is the ex under dimension. We have with the partnership not only an exchange of knowledge, but we also implement. So we have currently in the partnership, in the membership, 22 programs operating in more than 100 countries with over 200 projects in, on site. The objectives we are um, following in the Vision 2025 is to reach 500 million poor and vulnerable people with protection solutions by 2025, and also to support 80 countries with comprehensive disaster risk finance strategies by 2025. We have for that defined uh, concrete indicators and we will monitor them year by year and we will seek achievement through the solutions, also through innovation, as we have very interesting partners in this partnership. So we will together deliver on aspirational, transformative, but achievable results through voluntary collaborative efforts. And it's a lot about coordination of work, coordination of actors, collaboration in the space, and especially collaboration in countries to look for most efficient, most effective and tailor-made solutions for these countries. And Aoluto has already explained uh, how PICREEC is doing that. We have in the partnership, a strong collaboration with the private sector, for example, through the Insurance Development Forum, with really large international companies and also international um, actors to really reinforce and uh, bring in all their knowledge, experience, but also capacity and money uh, into that play. And uh, we also collaborate very strongly with the Vulnerable 20 group, the V20. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be in this panel because um, Maybelline, and then being our moderator, I was really instrumental here in the V20, in um, also uh, with the co-chair through the Marshall Islands here. And we have a very good um, and strong collaboration. I'm talking about countries and programs that are directly engaged in under the partnership now in the past in the next few minutes. We have in the partnership, of course, I mentioned the Marshall Islands, who are holding the co-chair in the partnership, side to side with 
a T20 country, in this case, is Germany, and we have a rotating system. So we have also Fiji, we have Madagascar and the Philippines in the partnership, um, bringing up demand questions, but also very good solutions as uh, they are strongly working on new and um, tailor-made solutions for their countries. We have a high level consultative group, which sets the strategic direction of the partnership, um, as, as well as setting the global strategic vision for climate and disaster risk finance and insurance as well. So it's a large community that really brings uh, together the effort and develops solution further. As I said, the Marshall Islands with the finance minister, Alfred, Alfred Jr., um, um, is currently co-chairing our highest steering committee. There are more um, and very interesting risk solutions similar to what uh, Ahalotu has uh, said, peak Greek, we have the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Fund Insurance Facility, Secret, which is also an implementing partner of the Interresilience Global Partnership, alongside with the African Risk Capacity, which has also several island states. We are also just commencing a collaboration with the Pacific NDC Hub, the National Determined Contributions Partnership, that uh, arm that works in the Pacific, and we are seeking now in our common project to integrate climate and disaster risk finance and insurance into national adaptation efforts and strategies. There are a number of uh, examples I would like to share, and I see questions coming in that are really very, very thought provoking. And uh, I would like to address some of the questions already with what I, I'm going to bring up. We are working with the United Nations University on creating a, a very precise um, insurance and resilience uh, risk uh, assessment tool. Um, and we have published recently a study on disaster risk and readiness for insurance solutions in small island development states. You can find it on the internet on our web, the website. The project assessed climate and disaster risk as well as the readiness for insurance solutions in uh, 38 small island development states. Yeah, and um, we also are supporting the V20, and the V20 currently have um, developed a sustainable insurance facility looking at the backbone of the economy of many of the countries, namely at micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And I've seen a question on business contingency um, and supporting the business side in the questionnaire here. So um, this is geared towards really uh, facilitating a platform for members of the partnership to support here, particularly the um, medium, small and micro, medium, small and sized enterprises looking for uh, solutions. And they have started now uh, piloting these uh, activities with the Philippines, the Marshall Islands, for example, and also uh, Fiji, um, and more countries are coming up. There is also a recent activity supported by members of the partnership, the UNDP and Munich Climate Insurance Initiative. It's called the Pacific Insurance and Climate Adaptation Program. That is uh, now had started in January 21 in Fiji, Vanuatu, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, and Tonga. And this program aims to improve the financial preparedness and resilience of Pacific Islanders towards climate change and natural hazards through the development and implementation of market-based meso and micro-insurance schemes. So we are having uh, programs that range from the uh, governmental level to the meso level, subnational level, down to the micro level. There's also the Asian Pacific Climate Finance Fund, and I've seen questions on the funding opportunities. This fund, uh, by uh, managed by Asian Development Bank, has um, implementing partners as an implementing partner is covering mitigation 
and adaptation project. And interestingly, there are also strong links between mitigation and adaptation projects that can be seen. And as I said before, and as Dr. Kiming has mentioned, um, de-risking the assets um, is so important. And with uh, that, you can attract investors, investments for further economic development. Um, um, well, success stories. Oh. Sorry, uh, Astrid. If if I may invite the rest of the panelists, uh, since you're answering the questions, if I may invite them to go ahead and come on um, on camera, and then sorry, we'll continue with the Q and A session. <laughs> sorry about that. No, I'm happy to take questions, of course. Um, Martin and Alotu, if you may uh, please come back on camera and we'll, we'll go ahead with the questions. Um, Astrid, I'm sorry, you may continue and then right after you're done with your question and answering the questions, I can start off. Uh, we have numerous questions already coming in, so I'll, I'll go from the top to bottom um, and try to stay within the, the time limit we have. Thank you. Um, Astrid, I think um, she's frozen for now. Um, perhaps maybe I can go ahead and move on to the first question. We have several questions that came in during Martin's uh, presentation. Astrid, are you back with us? I'm back with you. I'm oh, sorry okay. for the technical inconvenience with the frozen monitor, but I could take over the first question if you allow me. Okay, so yeah, the question didn't really address anyone, but uh, that the question is how do the investment requirements compare to recent insurance coverage payouts? Is that the one you, you're looking at? That's right. And okay. uh, I, is that fine for you if I started and probably my co-panelists uh, come in uh, with me then? Absolutely, yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, yes, insurance payouts, uh, of course, uh, um, are really, um, uh, uh, really um, um, at a certain uh, amount. I can give you some examples. For example, um, we had um, through the African risk capacity, the African regional uh, sovereign risk pool uh, payout in 2020. Um, 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 to Madagascar, for example, um, of 2.13 million uh, US dollars um, to cover anticipated losses to livelihoods and its vulnerable population from the crop failure in the just concluded farming season. In Haiti, for example, last year, uh, after Cyclone Laura, um, when more than 44,000 people were adversely affected by heavy rainfalls and more than 6,000 homes flooded, um, the uh, country's excess rainfall parametric insurance policy with the CRIF, the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility, was triggered, and Haiti received a payout of approximately 7.2 million US dollars to enable quick relief. And I have, I said quick relief because, of course, this, um, these payouts from the programs under the partnership may not cover fully uh, investments uh, for new infrastructure, but they cover first start, first steps to really get back to the feet again, to look into first uh, reconstruction of infrastructure, um, to pay uh, out for uh, giving the poor and vulnerable people um, a possibility to survive, um, to get water, to get food. Um, there is a good in, um, example. The African risk capacity, for example, has um, the condition for um, their insurance that governments um, set up contingency plans when taking insurance. And with the contingency plans, they really can kickstart the appropriate processes for relief and for recovery. But it is, of course, not enough to build up 
whole, uh, comprehensively a total infrastructure of a country. Um, that's so far from my side. Uh, but I, I hand over to uh, Aho, Aholo to Palo. Hello to Martin, do you have any um, additional answers to that question? I think uh, Maybelline, uh, yeah. Astrid had covered it uh, comprehensively, uh, given the example that she mentioned, uh, and also mentioned some example during my, my talk. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm just looking through the questions and I'm uh, being mindful of the time. So if I may just jump into one uh, regarding the AIIB. Um, there's a question from Mark. Um, it's a um, question asking, is AIIB fine? finding success cooperating with the World Bank and ADB in helping to promote resilience and development in the Pacific Islands? Are there any major efforts AAIB is promoting for the PICS or the PIC? Prick also mentioned the World Bank effort. Is any one of the speakers actively involved in ADB's effort? So I'll leave that up first to Martin and then maybe perhaps we can come to Alotu and Astrid after that. Thank you. Thank you, Maybelline. Uh, uh, quickly, there was a comment uh, before that, uh, uh, whether GDP is the right measure, we, we should include the happiness index. I leave that up to the, to the participants. Uh, uh, our happiness ultimately is the thing we want to achieve, but I thought it was a very humorous question, so I, I mentioned it. So um, investing in, in, I mean, all, whether it's the World Bank, the ADB or us, uh, we have always a challenge in, in, in investing in, in the really small island economies. Uh, point is, it's, it's, uh, we are not compensated. There's such a high uh, uh, pre-preparation and implementation cost that it's never going to get compensated through the loan amounts, etc. So what we typically do is, is, is we, uh, we align ourselves with, with um, soft soft sponsors who i mean these are organizations with a special mandate which we try then to partner with to sort of to get over the cost hurdle uh, so we have done investments uh maladies is a bit larger uh, uh we've done maladies uh, uh, uh we've done cook islands but particularly in cook islands we could not have done it would we have not had, had access to to uh to that, such a soft fund pro providers and uh, we I mean both uh, uh, Maldives and as well as uh, uh, Cook, we co-financed with the World Bank on one side or IFC, uh, uh, as well as uh, with the ADB on on the um, on the Cook Islands. Classic, you know, we uh, we do partner uh, uh, in order sort of to to burden that that cost issue that we have. Uh, it's the whole logistics around it. Uh, uh, you know, you cannot do your record the monitoring. You just cannot fly someone. Uh, uh, around the world uh, uh, for a small project, the absorption capacity of the of the economy is 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 fairly small. So if you think an average project size, I don't know, of us, uh, uh, well, in the private sector, it's 50 million plus, in in, in the sovereign loan, it's, it's 200 million plus. Uh, both uh, would be big challenges for many of those uh, economies. So we have to downsize. So the whole cost structure. We have to uh, to maintain. Uh, we need to find solutions for, and 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 the loose the solution we've been applying is to partner with organizations uh, uh, who can help us to to facilitate those investments. That would be it. Thank you for that answer. Um, Alota, did you uh, want to follow up with another additional answer, or your? Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Astrid. Do you have anything uh, to? I've answered you that one, or can we move on to the next question? We have a few more questions to go through. I see, but uh, a quick uh, response. Uh, under the partnership, we are uh, we are having a vehicle that is called a program alliance, which is a coalition with World Bank, UNDP, and now ADB, uh, also the Interresilent Solutions Fund, and uh, UK and Germany, and more are coming together. And I like this question very much because it's about getting the actors together, working in the particular countries. And they believe you know the Program Alliance very well through uh, your uh, work and experience. Uh, we are really trying to do and to, to collaborate in the countries um, to, um, and uh, provide 
different services from the different actors along the risk continuum uh, in order to support a country with tailor-made solutions. I'm stopping here then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I will go ahead and move on to the next question. It's asked by, um, it's an anonymous person, but um, the question is, how are the risk management financing catering to intersectional and cascading risk? Did anyone want to, uh, does anyone want to give it a try? Um, yes, this is Astrid. <laughs> Let, let's, let's try um, with um, what we try to achieve with the climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions and uh, supporting countries with a more comprehensive risk strategy in their adaptation efforts. Uh, it is um, clear that not every type of a financial solution needs every type of risk. So we are striving for a, a layered strategy. Um, risks that are extremely high, but uh, come in uh, with a low frequency, but very high intensity, they are most efficiently covered by insurance. But risks that are uh, very low, um, doesn't cost too much, um, and are coming in quite frequently, um, can be borne by budget reallocation, can be borne by savings. Um, so this is uh, what the way we try to look at. Um, so not one solution fits all, but very much tailored to the situation in the country and to the types of risk. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. Um, hello to Anne Martin. Do you have any additional answers to that? Okay. Um, again, because of the time, I'm just looking at uh, a question that asks all panelists. Um, the question is, are you looking into expanding your offerings or insurance solution outside catastrophe relief asset loss? We are seeing a general withdrawal from risk for insurance insurances on and laws of coverage for things such as medical indemnity for our doctors, which is particularly problematic as with less resources, medics in small island necessarily take more risk. Maybelline, if I, if I say something just in response to the questions, I think, we've, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, you know, Piquet is a, an infant company and we are still learning Full ways of developing the products is really fitting with uh, the need of the countries. And currently, we are just facing on three products, as I mentioned, cyclone and uh, earthquake and tsunami. But that's on a solvent arrangement. Uh, we are, we have uh, changed our act, amendment our act. Uh, then we are awaiting approval from Parliament of Cook Islands because that's where the company is based. Uh, once that's approved, then we are moving to some sort of a segregated cell in which we will respond to each areas uh, beyond just no uh, sovereign uh, product, meaning that we have to go down to the micro level, private sector, uh, health, whatever. But that's uh, further down the road. But as of now, uh, because we are still an infant uh, company, we are building the covenant system to, in place to try to strengthen that. And at the same time, try to build the human resource of uh, availability and also the technical capability of the company so that we can at least absorb whatever it's potentially that the company can encase going forward. But there is a potential well, given the pandemic uh, issue now with COVID. That's something that maybe if the markets decide to to insure, that will something that we'll have to look into the, to that to for further investment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to the next question, which asks what MCII or UN have just started in Fiji on sounds us very much like what the World Group have been doing through Pregrefi for years. How will these initiatives collaborate or work together? Excellent. Um, well, the PCAP, as uh, Esri mentioned, speak at Pacific Island uh, Climate Adaptation Program or project. We are working closely with them, but that's more like an uh, initiative from the country. 
Uh, there is no duplications, or perhaps what they are doing, they're going down to the micro level. As I said, they go going to develop some sort of a model to see if that's applicable and is it feasible uh, in terms of application here in the region. But we are working closely with that under a working group, um, which is under the FLDB, which is the uh, Framework for Resilient Development in the Pacific, and also uh, under the vehicle called Partnership for Resilient in the Pacific. So we are working closely with them to avoid any duplications, but at the same time, identify areas that where we can build synergies going forward. But there's a, a country initiative, as I mentioned during my talk, it's quite expensive. They go to the market individually. Uh, it has to, you know, like we fully understand the market. If you build the risk, consolidate your risk, you build the risk, you're creating some sort of economies of scale, which you can go and find it very cheap. Uh, premium to the country. So, but we're working closely with them. But maybe Esri is one to add. No, thank you. I can't uh, add more uh, to that. It was perfectly uh, responded. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump to the last questions and I'll roll back um, later on if we do have more time. But this is a question from Jesse Mello. It, um, I've read about ocean ecosystem resilience uh, PPP structures where parametric payouts uh, support science and ecosystem restoration after an event rather than, um, for example, to rebuild houses. Are these innovative concepts likely to be implemented in the near future? Um, does anyone want to give that? A try. That's, that's a good point. That's that, that's a good uh, question and good point. I think, you know, like to have some sort of insurance of any for restorations or for protections of our natural resources. I think that I understand that I had been some initiative in terms of looking into that, but it's depending on the market. If there is, if they, if the market thing is, is insurable, I think uh, that would be something that for for my for the regional company to see if there is a potential to develop some sort of a model to you know, to absorb such a demand coming out. But it depends on the market, whether they, you know, someone out there to develop some sort of a model that will help us in terms of uh, identifying areas where the limitations and where we opportunities are uh, for us to take forward. Uh, I also would like to add something because we are working uh, together with partners like the Nature Conservancy or with Mercy Corps on nature-based solutions where, uh, for example, in a project like um, in Mexico currently, natural uh, coral reefs are restored. So um, through a um, kind of uh, resilience and uh, investment into this, um, uh, increasing the resilience of coral reefs, that can be linked to, uh, for example, also uh, to insurance premiums and to insurance. Um, once the risk, and ultimately the idea is once the risk is, reduced because coral reefs and the growth rate is interesting. It's quite high, um, uh, what, uh, what the uh, studies are showing. And once the coral reefs are growing and protecting coastal um, uh, lines, uh, the, the insurance um, premium might also go down. So there's an interesting link between investment in resilience of natural ecosystems and insurance. Um, there's uh, quite some action uh, going on and also I invite everybody to uh, look at, uh, for example, our web page where we uh, hold a lot of um, these examples uh, in, uh, under www.injuresilience.org. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna go back up and I think this question was asked while Martin was presenting. And so I'll go ahead and uh, give this time to Martin to answer. It's uh, to what extent is industry recognizing, encouraging and rewarding resilient asset? For example, insure, insurers through lower premiums, banks through lower rates, valuers through higher valuations. So um, that's a question. If Martin, you want to give it a try, we'll uh, go to the others um, after you answer. Yeah. Look, look. This is a this is a different thing because it, it mixes market forces uh, uh, with a subsidy element, and and um, it, it 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 can be mixed. We 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 had we had structures again where we where we mix uh, 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 on financing structures uh, uh, where we get first loss components in where we get uh, uh, additional support in that would not uh, that would 
not be possible uh, otherwise. So the challenge is always, to what extent do you distort uh, 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 an infant private sector that would come up to develop things on, on, on a sustainable basis with structures that do provide um, a social need and, and service. And, and I, I am, um, many island economies uh, have high vulnerability to shocks, but decent long-term economic fundamentals. So the issue is to survive shocks. The issue is not the, the, the long-term underlying economic perspective. So I, I, I would hope that a, a private sector can have growth opportunities because ultimately governance, public sector donors cannot fill the investment need that, that, that has to be raised in order to close the development gap. Uh, uh, so I am, I am in the camp, if we don't distort, uh, and, and, and and sort of a, 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 a sort of a, an existing pri private sector and, and create a, a, the wrong uh, incentives in an economy. I am I'm typically trying to find solutions to find uh, obviously more attractive financing packages that take uh, into account the social dimension. But I'm I'm often very concerned about the uh, potential distortion this might lead to, uh, 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 to the private sector in a specific country. Thank you, Martin. Lotu, did you also want to add to that? Well, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, since we touched on private sector, there's a question on, uh, it's not just the private sector, but how can civil society and the private sector play greater role or access fund to improve this uh, disaster risk reduction capacity is uh, from an anonymous um, person. So. If, you want, if I want to add to that, I think it's really important to engage with private sector or even civil society in terms of advocacy, you know, advocating what we are doing. Uh, let, me, let me share an experience in the Pacific because insurance penetration here is very low uh, compared to developing countries. And because of this, uh, what you call it, uh, moral hazard attitude that they are facing with because everyone is relaxing. Well, we just wait, uh, New Zealand, Australia, other countries, post disaster, they will fly in their set with all humanitarian assistance, which will provide for them uh, post disaster situations. And that's well embedded in the mind, perhaps maybe on the policy makers and also policy decision making people. So just wait. And that should also affect the, you know, in terms of moving to buy premium to a bigger situation and trying to understand the difference between risk pooling and traditional insurance. That has also some agreed uh, some sort of a confusion on the ground and also impacted that. And I think engaging with private sector and civil society that they will do some sort of a training through uh, capacity building program, whatever seminar, workshop, uh, scholarship as I mentioned, intensive to create the awareness to also increase the technical understanding on the ground here in the Pacific so that they start thinking not just to wait or to receive the humanitarian aid in the end, but to start having the mentality to prepare, to put aside some money when it's rain, you can be able to buy an umbrella. That mentality has not been really, really there in the Pacific, and you know it for sure, Maybelline, when you're working. So we are slowly, slowly trying to penetrate to that area, to that space and see if we can have that change of mindset by encouraging, by participating, jointly with civil society and private sector to really train our people here in the region to have that mentality so that in the end of the day they don't look at insurance in terms of cost they look at insurance is in terms of investment over to you Maybelline. thank you um astrid i see your camera coming on i didn't know if you wanted to add to that Yes, just a quick word. In our partnership, the private sector is very strongly involved and uh, among the visions, indicators and, 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 and goals, the private sector will provide 5 billion US dollar capacity in risk capital to the uh, of development of new solutions and together with the insurance development forum, 
UNDP, and Germany, the BMZ, the Ministry for International Cooperation, they have endorsed, embarked on a journey on a it's called tripartite agreement to support more than 20 countries with particular uh, solutions um, for uh, climate and disaster risk finance and uh, insurance. Um, they've started work in, in uh, a few countries already and are uh, um, continuing with that. So there is a lot of capacity and uh, experience flowing in. And with the, pro pu uh, with the public sector or the non-governmental organizations, they are also very active in, in several countries. I'm just mentioning um, Oxfam, for example, together with the World Food Programme, they have developed an, um, an, a scheme which is uh, addressing agriculture, the agricultural sector. It's called R4. So especially for the poor and vulnerable people um, that have problems to pay, they can for example, develop risk management or do the uh, comprehensive risk management um, and uh, get insurance for that. Um, so there are quite innovative and new solutions uh, out. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much for those answers. Now I'm going to ask a question that's um, uh, pretty interesting. It's uh, asked by CB. Um, I guess it will be for everyone. It says, for some, their existential threat isn't climate related, change, climate related, it's human rights related and abuse of their protected characteristics. So how are the financial markets recognizing and incentivizing adoption of solution that address this? Um, anyone wanna give it a try first? Martin, Astrid? Can you repeat the human rights part? I, I didn't fully hear that. I was looking for the questions in writing. Okay, uh, so that human rights part of your of your question. It's human rights related and abuse of their protected characteristics. Uh, how so? How are the financial markets recognizing yeah. and incentivizing yeah. adoption of solutions that yeah. uh, address this? Yeah, yeah. Look. Uh, uh, we, uh, I mean, I, I can speak for all the uh, multilateral uh, development banks. Uh, we have uh, environmental, so social uh, uh, performance standards, and and in any case, when we look at sustainable uh, development, we look to a large extent, obviously, on on the effect uh, the social effect uh, uh, investments have. So we closely look um, at, at any impact that investment have on the livelihood of the people. Uh, now, worst case is obviously from, from uh, relocation uh, uh, to, to other direct or indirect I uh, impacts. Then the other thing that we obviously do is, is we work with parties that go to, to, to a solid uh, integrity check, not just a compliance check, also an integrity check. And and uh, human rights violation uh, uh, would not would not fall into an acceptable uh, uh, criteria of an investment partner, but we, we are all uh, we we see uh, the whole stakeholdership of of of, of NGOs uh, being as important as our capital owners. You know, we are we are organizations of the global community, and 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 we obviously uh, do represent the value set. Of, of all our stakeholders. And, and uh, uh, as I said, um, uh, we, we go at large lengths uh, uh, to, to avoid uh, uh, exposures uh, 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 that, that could be linked to, 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 to any human rights violations. And this is a trend you see everywhere. This is not just us. Okay, thank you. Astrid, I also see your... Um not muted, did yes. you wanna? Okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, the partnership uh, is uh, and the activities are geared towards the poor and vulnerable people. And I think that's also an important um, aspect here with regard to human rights as it tries to achieve more inclusiveness. We also have a, a working group on inclusive insurance underneath the uh, Insurance Development Forum and uh, we are really looking for not only climate risks, but we also go beyond, we are looking for financial inclusion. And let me share another thought on that question, um, the gender dimension. 
We are um, uh, also um, with the partnership um, and its members. We have um, uh, we have endorsed a gender declaration, trying to really uh, promote gender. Uh, responsiveness um, and the gender mainstreaming in climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. We are at the beginning. There are very good examples already. And we have started to gather that on a platform which is called a Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions, which will build up. Uh, this is also co-chaired by various actors like Canada and Care International. And uh, with um, these partners and uh, a working group, an international working group, we are driving best practice examples, but also trying to provide guidance and also services to those who are developing climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid. Um, I have another question here and it's uh, posted by Dave. Um, it, he's saying, very nice to hear about the uniqueness of the insurance solution, but does it cover business continuity assurance, which is critical component of the recovery process? Uh, maybe if I may add, then uh, my other colleague speakers also, also add if I uh, not fully answered the questions. Um, you know, the Pacific Atasoyers Insurance Company is a company that provide immediate liquidity post-disaster, as I said during my talk. Uh, we try our best to see if we can send the money to the country, to the policyholders or the participating countries within 10 days, within 10 days, immediately. And that will help the government in terms of their uh, response, immediate response to businesses affected or, you know, everyone was affected from the disaster. That liquidity was supposed to help them. And at the same time, speed up the recovery and then reconstructions. The beauty with the payout that we are giving to the countries, which has given the money, and it's completely up to the government of the day to how to utilize the money. Whether they want to use that for their recovery, whether they want it for reconstruction, it's completely up to them. There's no conditionality attached to that when we give out the payout to the countries. So, and, and there's no loss assessment to be contacted before we pay out. This is a, a predetermined, uh, defined, triggers of the assessment of the disaster. So, and, and based on the model, and that's also linked to how much Bayard will keep based on the triggers. And immediately post disaster, we provide the liquidity immediately. Uh, and that's to supposed to help countries relieve the fiscal pressure on their fiscal balance. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Lotu. Martin and Astrid, do you, did you wanna add anything else to that? Okay, I do have another question and this will be for Lotu. Um, so my question would be, what do you see as one of the main challenges or hurdles for the Pacific countries having continued access to the kinds of products that FICRIC offers in order to build their own resilience to disaster? Over to you. Happy start. Um, Success of a country has a lot to do with, with the um, governance uh, environment, the institutional setup that exists, the predictability, the quality of, 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 of institutions you work with. And that is fully in control of, 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 of a country. And uh, if we look at development success, um, this is not just determined by island, uh, by islands, but in general, this is one of the major uh, the development drivers uh, uh, that, uh, that you can have. There's a continuity, uh, that's good planning, uh, that's good implementation. Um, so to me, this, this is a differentiator, both uh, in attracting capital and, and opportunities, uh, but also allow countries to, to, to drive their own path. I, I'm always for getting away from this donor recipient mentality and, and, and drive your own destiny. If I had uh, maybe for the questions, and thank you for that. I think one of the biggest uh, challenges for the Pacific country governments is the affordability of insurance premium. Um, you know, everyone knows and understand countries now have a better understanding of the risks they face. And governments know there is strong rationale for purchasing insurance that provides them with quick payouts. 
so they can act quickly after a major disaster event. And I'm sure the Tona communities, they also understand the rationale for providing countries with finance in a way that they can support their own citizens that have been impacted by a disaster in a cost-effective way. But it remains a, a challenge for countries to pay the required premium. As you understand, uh, you know, the cost of it is can be, uh, when we provide to countries say you were supposed to pay a million for your premium, it, it may sound minimal to some countries like developing countries, developed countries, but it's a huge amount to ask to a small country like Tuvalu, Tonga, maybe Marshall Islands also. And as I explained, uh, the company is able to offer insurance coverage to countries very cheap. Then they could buy insurance themselves in the international market because they are going individually. So the company be able to consolidate the risk and then we send it to the market, which is cheaper in terms of um, available premium to the countries. And that make them have some sort of a meaningful bailouts when a disaster occurs. So for these situations, uh, it has been even more challenging right now, as I said uh, during my talk, that the impact of COVID, which has dramatically reduced the fiscal space of all the countries here in the region. So I therefore wish to call on our development partners to respond to these needs and recognize this opportunity to help Pacific countries in terms of continuing to build their own resilient and disaster event by providing some sort of a premium financing subsidization, how whatever mortality they go and offer the countries so that they can be able to be resilient, not 100%, give it to the countries in the Pacific in a way that we can share the cost so that there is some sense of ownership and commitment from the countries who are the partners are providing resources to help them out. Thank you, Maybelline, over to you. Thank you, Lotu. Um, are there any other feedback to Lotu's um, answer? Ashley yeah. Martin? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to quickly uh, touch on what uh, Lotu has said uh, on the affordability. And that's the value where the partnership can come in because we are currently together with uh, donor countries and uh, more partners developing um, a kind of, I mean, we, we will discuss the premium, smart premium and capital support topic, uh, bringing it to the COP26 uh, uh, as well. We'll uh, discuss how this can be provided uh, to countries, to governments in a smart and sustainable way. Um, that's uh, the point uh, because uh, we uh, we know that this should not come as an, an, an additional international aid, but this should come as helping a capital risk capital solution um, and helping uh, risk um, being transferred into the capital market and using the the market force in a way, but also incentivizing um, to uh, look at risk finance and insurance solutions which are. Um, for risks that cannot be mitigated, avoided, um, which are uh, most uh, effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are um, no more feedback, we have five more minutes to go and I'd like to just quickly ask another question. Hopefully we have time to cover this. Uh, it's, um, um, Guy Taylor is asking, innovation of utmost importance to the future of populations affected by the conversation here today, how does the panel view the need to find further solutions to the problems not being addressed by the solutions uh, on offer already? Anyone wants to give a try? Are there any other solutions? I guess uh, this is what the question is asking other than what has been discussed here today. Maybe I can, I again, I, I'm not an insurance person. But when I look at the innovations that is 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 happening on on the um, on the telecommuting arrangements, you know, on on the um, uh, non-motor companies, on on cloud-based uh, uh, computing, uh, there is no reason why not world-class services can be provided and uh, uh, consumed at a small island economy today. And, and I think we have only just scratched the surface of the opportunities uh, 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 that these technological disruptions is 
providing. For example, just finance the satellite for Indonesia. And the predominant function of the satellite is, is to provide uh, data service, services to the islands. And that satellite can be even programmed. You can even uh, provide bandwidth for other for other islands that are not part of Indonesia. But these type of, of things offer tremendous uh, uh, opportunities, uh, access to education, uh, providing ser services where you don't have to be physical, be present, etc. So I, I do uh, uh, believe that this virtual connectivity of, of the island economies uh, can add significantly to their uh, economic potential going forward. Great answer. Thank you very much, Martin. Astrid, did you have anything else to add to that? And then we'll go to Lotu after Astrid. Astrid? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I was muted. Uh, I just uh, wanted to say that uh, Martin covered that uh, very well in, uh, in his words. Thank you. All right, and Lotu, you don't have anything else. Well, we have yes. a few more minutes, so perhaps I can touch one more question before we um, end the session today. Um, this is also by Dave. His question is liquidity response to the sovereign country usually goes to infrastructure and people recovery and not to the business recovery. I assume it is because it is believed that the private sector must take care of itself as profit is self-motivated. Anyone I, wants I to- fully, I fully agree with the proposal, you know, private sector should take um, care of themselves. But like what I said right at the beginning, we are currently offering sovereign product to the countries in the region and just for immediate liquidity of you know sending out to the countries to support their earliest response post disaster so we are going to move from to embrace also non sovereign product in terms of going down to embrace private sector so we are pushing the risk to the private sector once we the law will be enacted hopefully by end of the year by the government of Cook Islands. So then we work with the private sector in terms of pushing the risk to private sector to take up that risk in terms of businesses, in terms of uh, whatever they do from that space. But that's the current situation that we are in now. That's a good proposal, I think, and to share the risk. But the immediate liquidity that we are providing, we are, we got nothing to do. Once we send the money to Tonga, for example, the company is out of uh, hands in terms of uh, accountability, or usage of the money that we send to the countries. So they all, it's all up to them, whether they want to use it for affected businesses, whether they want to use it for, you know, affected church or something like that, or community halls, it completely up to the government. That was the, the reasons why the company was established. Thank you. Go ahead, Martin, I see you raise, raising your hand. Yeah, well, it took me almost one and a half hours to finally find something where I, <laughs> can offer an additional perspective to Lotu. Uh, as public sector, private sector has any right uh, to, to get support as it sits by a crisis. A private sector company has uh, is producing pu uh, public goods, a public sector is, is producing public goods. So there is no reason why why neither of them should should be excluded from, 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 from disaster help. So what we have been doing uh, uh, as a, COVID response, we wanted to make sure businesses remain in operation uh, because the exit and entry of a businesses is way more expensive with a huge social cost uh, than supporting a business uh, throughout a crisis, employ many families, uh, etc. Et so we worked with, with banks uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to, to have sufficient uh, credit capacity and working capital loan to support companies uh, throughout the crisis, essentially to, to diminish this, this exit risk of, of, of uh, companies and, and successful uh, employment. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think we are um, running out of time. We're exactly at 8.30 right now. I, don't, I wanna make sure that we all exit and nobody gets cut off. But first, uh, before we do end this session, I wanna thank you all very much, Martin, Lotu and Astrid for your time. Uh, we learned a lot from this session. Thank you very much to all, all our um, audience. Uh, have a great day and uh, hope to get in touch with you on uh, later on. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for the excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All Good right. night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Bye.